before uh, completely begin the event, the event, I want to, of course, acknowledge that uh, this event is everything we do is on unceded uh, Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh, Tsleil um, First Nations land um, that is now Vancouver. Um, I want to thank the SFU Institute for the Humanities and its director, Samir Gandesha, for uh, supporting this initiative and uh, funding this wonderful, wonderful space that we're able to use today. Um, also, SFU International Studies and the Vancouver East Coast Socialists have supported the event, um, as has Ricochet as a media sponsor. Three small things um, to, to keep in mind, um, and hopefully that can guide this discussion guide this discussion a little bit. Um, first, I mean, I think, I don't think the word, the word historic might be a bit of an overstatement, but it's not perhaps too far off um, in describing what's happening in, in, in Greece right now that we've had after five years of crisis, finally, um, an anti-austerity government, um, a government of the radical left in, in Europe, in the global north, um, that's challenging the policies that have been ravaging the continent uh, for the past five, six years. Um, and I think relevant for the, for the left as well that this is the first left government to grapple with the sort of financialized, globalized capitalism um, of, in the global north um, that's, that's really taking shape over the last um, couple decades. Um, on the other hand, I think it's important to keep in mind how open the situation is, and I think the speakers will probably all speak to that, especially Natasa. Um, there are lots of tensions within Europe, tensions within Greek society, within Syriza itself, um, and I think the interaction of all of these things, tensions within the institutions that are the main uh, creditors to Syriza right now, um, and I think all of these things make the situation since the election of Syriza on January the 25th of this year, um, very fluid. Um, and I mean, there's dangers both uh, from all sides, basically, and, and, and potentials for, for something happening from, from all sides. Um, and I think the third thing that I want to highlight is just the connection with, and the connections that we can draw with what's happening here. Um, we haven't seen the kind of anti-austerity struggles especially outside Quebec within Canada, but I think there's something that we can certainly learn, um, of course modified for our local context, but something that we can learn from Syriza and from Greece. Um, and hopefully that's something that we can talk about more, especially in, in the discussion, once we've had the chance to, to hear about what's been happening in Greece and, and in Europe um, for the last while and what's led up to this moment. Um, so we do have three speakers. Um, first up, we'll have Ingo Schmidt, who's in the middle here. Um, Ingo teaches labor studies um, at Athabasca University. He lives in Vancouver, um, but I know his, his heart is still in Europe, um, in his native Germany and, and in other places. He has a PhD in economics. Um, he still maintains close ties with Germany, writes frequently on economic topics, on Greece, on the crisis of social democracy and the European economic crisis. Um, and that's precisely what he'll be telling us more about. So, Ingo, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Doing some mic check first. Uh, are we... Both, okay. closer. <laughs> Is this better now? I'm too old for this mic check thing I... No? Okay. Um, well, um, first of all, I want to uh, thank Michal, uh, because uh, without him this event uh, wouldn't uh, have come on uh, tonight. So uh, everybody who likes this uh, shall thank uh, Michal, and if you happen to not like uh, what's going on uh, this evening, then it's probably uh, somebody else's fault. Certainly not his, <laughs> no, he, he really put lots of uh, effort into this. So, so the side door it is for me after the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and uh, other than that, uh, just uh, jumping in the, into the topic of the economics of austerity, I think I have the easiest part tonight 
because uh, I only have to explain how uh, Greece and other countries also uh, across Europe uh, ended up in the crisis uh, where they're in right now, which of course is much easier uh, to do than uh, finding a way out of the crisis, and I leave that to my Greek uh, comrades. Uh, and hopefully uh, can learn something from that because we are in desperate need of learning from people who are struggling against this beast that we call austerity these days. Um, now it ha seems to become a bit of a buzzword, austerity. Uh, people on the left uh, talk about it lots, nobody knows exactly what it is. Uh, and lefties always need a buzzword. A few years ago, we would have had globalization, then neoliberal neoliberalism became the buzzword, and we never knew exactly what it is, but we sure didn't like it, and uh, nowadays uh, it's austerity uh, that we sure don't like. Um, now, I'm not sure whether I come up uh, with a proper definition, but uh, I'm, I hope I can... Uh, uh, point to some of the problems uh, and uh, how the crisis uh, ended up in Greece. Um, if we speak about uh, austerity, uh, one thing we have to know is what it is not about. And this is so important because if you do read uh, the newspapers, uh, and I encourage everybody to spend most of their time reading uh, the business newspapers, because that is where important issues are being discussed, meaning issues that pertain to your uh, private lives and working lives. Uh, and when they talk about uh, austerity, they say it is about paying off public debt. It is not about paying off public debt. Uh, if they talk about austerity, they say it's about rolling back the state. It is not about rolling back the state. If they talk about austerity, uh, they say it is about a creating a level playing field uh, on the world market where everybody can uh, um, compete uh, on an equal level and succeed if uh, he or she only tries hard enough. It's not about creating a level field. What austerity really is about, at least uh, that's my point of view, is using state power, the state is here to stay, using state power to redistribute wealth within countries from poor to rich and also across countries and again from poor to rich. And this happens globally, uh, as is probably widely acknowledged that there's very poor countries and a few pretty rich countries. Uh, and in all of these rich countries, of course, you also find lots of poor people. And this redistribution also happens within Europe. And this is what I'm uh, going to talk about, obviously, tonight. Uh, that's our topic. But I will not start with Greece. I will start with uh, post-Second World War Germany. Uh, and you will see uh, why in a moment. After the Second World War, Germany uh, was economically destroyed, politically, uh, well, let's say, uh, in shambles. But it got a second chance. It got a chance to compete successfully in the world market, largely shaped uh, by the United States of America. And the United States of America, with their allies, um, gave Germany this chance. A, they forgave lots of debt that the Germans had accumulated over the Second World War. They also forgave a lot of other things. Um, <laughs> And they gave Germany a very favorable exchange rate. Now, and on top of that, labor was at that point not dirt poor, uh, dirt cheap, but pretty cheap. And that was uh, a leftover uh, happily uh, maintained uh, after the fall of the Nazi regime, which was cheap wages, uh, low wages. So low wages, favorable exchange rate, no debt. While it's not so difficult to compete on um, those uh, three counts, and the Germans did, and they became a major world exporter. On the other side of uh, the globe, uh, you would see something similar in Japan. The Americans were very good picking allies, former enemies in the war, who would then serve as uh, bastions uh, in the struggle against uh, communism. So from the West and the East, you see kind of there was this containment strategy of the Soviet Union, uh, which was a welcome pretext for the Americans to establish their empire and make new friends, like with the Germans who were so grateful that everything was forgiven to them 
uh, and they could start uh, flooding the world market uh, with their Volkswagens and BMWs rather with their tanks, which hadn't uh, been such a resounding success in the past. <laughs> The trouble with that success of uh, selling all these Volkswagens and BMWs uh, is that one of the countries that imported lots of that stuff, uh, the United States of America I'm talking, um, ended up in a current account uh, deficit, meaning they lived, in economics language, they lived beyond their means. They started not only importing these uh, nice cars and other things, they also had to start importing capital to pay for these things, meaning they started accumulating debt. Now, at some point, uh, the Americans uh, thought they had enough of that, not of the importing, but um, the magnitude of that, in particular the debt accumulation, and pulled the plug on the favorable exchange rate. Uh, that the Germans were given, and other countries too, after Second World War. Uh, there were fixed exchange rates uh, across the Western world, uh, and that uh, ended uh, in 1973. And the trouble for export stars like Germany, but also Japan, was that their currencies would rise in value, meaning their Volkswagens or Toyotas uh, would become uh, relatively more expensive in the United States of America. Uh, meaning there was competitive pressure. On top of that, within the United States, um, there were some adjustments under the pressure from all the incoming Volkswagens and Toyotas. Uh, Americans figured, well, we have to uh, do something, and that something is uh, we relocate production, and not to China, as many people believe, uh, even though Chicks, uh, Nixon had already been uh, uh, to China and uh, shook hands uh, with Chairman Mao. The relocation uh, was largely within the United States uh, from the Union States around the Great Lakes areas to the south uh, where you had Dixie but no unions, uh, meaning you had uh, cheap labor. So there was a bit of a rebouncing of American manufacturing or at least it looked uh, like there could be and uh, Germany had to figure out ways how to adjust to these uh, pressures. The Americans finding sources of cheap labor and the Deutschmark rising in value. Now, what could be done? Of course, um, you can um, go the American way and you find sources of cheap labor. And uh, so the Germans did, and uh, some smaller countries allied to them, uh, Austria and the Netherlands, for example, forming a mercantile uh, economic bloc. Um, they looked south, just like uh, the American industrialist manufacturers uh, had done. And what they saw was uh, post uh, uh, military and fascist dictatorships, uh, Mediterranean countries. Uh, you, um, see uh, Mediterranean countries uh, joining the European Common Market, which is now known as the European Union. Um, Greece was the first, actually, uh, joining the European uh, Common Market in 81. Spain and Portugal for the, um, followed in 1986. And they could have become kind of uh, the Dixie countries uh, of Germany if something unexpected would not have happened. And that unexpected was the collapse of the Soviet Union and its uh, allied or satellite, uh, depending on how you see this, um, uh, countries in Eastern Europe. Because what happened with that was that labor in uh, Southern Europe would have been cheaper than it, would have been in uh, than it was in Germany. But even cheaper was the Europe uh, Eastern European labor, and it was also uh, highly educated, um, that was a heritage uh, from state uh, socialism in those countries. Uh, so uh, very quickly uh, manufacturers figured, well, we are not uh, moving parts of our production to uh, the south, we go east and uh, we colonize uh, those uh, territories. And this, of course, left uh, the um, southern periphery of Europe uh, in a bit of a bind and uh, they didn't know exactly uh, what to do. Well, they found or they were assigned a new role and this is where European Monetary Union comes in quite handy um, because what European Monetary Union meant was that interest rates uh, in southern European countries uh, declined to German levels. And uh, for that reason, it became quite attractive and cheap to invest into Southern Europe. There was an influx of money 
from north to south within Europe, and that created a bubble. So southern Europe started uh, something similar uh, like the Anglo world, uh, Britain, Ireland, and the United States of America. They imported lots of money, and they enjoyed that money. They spent that money. Uh, today, they are uh, called lazy for doing that uh, and wasteful. But of course, German manufacturers were very grateful for this wastefulness, because uh, that's how they could continue selling their Volkswagens and BMWs, hoping that nobody would ever buy a Toyota. <laughs> now, um, as you uh, may have heard, uh, Canada didn't see much of it, but uh, not uh, far away from here, south of the border, uh, uh, people noticed that bubbles tend to burst, and then the buck stops, at least it stops for a while, and the people who um, uh, got some credit, even though nobody ever really expected them being able to pay it back, uh, well, they will be cut off uh, credit, but the people who gave, gave the credit, uh, the creditors, of course, they get a bailout. Um, and the bailout in Europe uh, happened uh, in similar ways it happened in the United States of America. Uh, again, it uh, goes from the poor to the rich. And the beauty of the European bailout was what uh, really happened was uh, that um, German and also some other, actually French banks were pretty big, uh, invested um, in Greece. I'm leaving out now Spain and uh, Portugal, uh, focusing just on Greece. So these banks in the European Center were bailed out, but that wasn't, it wasn't sold like that. It was sold as, um, well, the lazy Greeks blew all the money and now they have to pay the price, which is actually very similar to what happened in the US in the sense that you had all these uh, poor working class uh, households uh, whose wages were insufficient, who were talked into buying houses they really couldn't afford, but they were talked in buying them anyways. And um, when, they, when it turned out that they really couldn't afford them, well, then they were evicted. And equivalent to the evictions uh, of uh, poor working class uh, households in the United States, you got the Troika uh, marching into uh, Athens and telling um, Greek people to tighten their belts. Of course, not all uh, Greek people, only those uh, who were still uh, living and trying to make a living in Greece. Uh, smart Greeks, uh, of course, uh, were living there because it's beautiful, uh, as I hear from my Greek uh, comrades. Uh, but they were smart in the sense that their money was already somewhere else. Um, now, luckily, well, this is pretty much the end of my uh, economic story. Uh, you have a crisis, you have somebody who has to pay the price of the crisis. Of course, uh, these are the working classes in Greece. Uh, maybe at uh, some point later also the working classes uh, uh, in the creditor countries uh, of Europe. Um, and the question how this will unfold is obviously tied into the question how the political resistance that has developed in Greece uh, will develop. And this is where Syriza comes in, about uh, which uh, we obviously have more competent speakers than uh, I am. I will only say this much on that issue. Um, that I do not believe Syriza will be able to do it by itself. As much as I wish uh, that would be the case, I do not think that without the European progressive movement, Syriza will accomplish uh, very much. And that, of course, puts a huge responsibility on the left of other countries. In other words, if we in other countries don't get our shit together, then it's our responsibility uh, then if uh, Syriza fails. Uh, and on the question, uh, that's my uh, last point, uh, on the question um, what, how we can do these kind of, build these kind of movements against austerity, uh, I just want to mention a, a personal experience uh, which is partially uh, self-righteous. Being a left economist, uh, I'm in the business of uh, saying how awful the euro is uh, for a long time. Preparing for the, uh, tonight, uh, I uh, found this uh, old book from 1996 uh, that contains my first uh, article against the euro. And there's been lots of these articles um, by all left economists that you find in Europe and also in some from other parts of the world, all saying if this will be introduced, the euro, it will produce enormous social inequalities and regional inequalities. And it did. So as economists, we can say, 
We are very good. We told you so. <laughs> you may laugh. For an economist, that's an accomplishment because uh, <laughs> there's lots of other economists uh, whose predictions do not come to, notably the ones uh, who say the bubble can, keeps growing forever. But as a socialist, I must say, it didn't help us at all that we were so smart saying how awful things will be. And I think this is the great uh, challenge that understanding how we do get into this mess is one thing, and telling people this is how it will be is one thing. But it's probably not the biggest thing in building uh, movements uh, that are able to stop this thing. And I will stop here because I do not have very much to say on this, but I'm looking forward to learn about it from my Greek comments. Thank you very much. That reminds me of the other old joke about Marx's economists that they predicted 20 of the last 10 crises, but <laughs> that doesn't help us either. That's yeah. inappropriate, my friend. <laughs> That's 50%. That's 50% success. <laughs> <laughs> Too much. Uh,